Khan to bring you this important message. Hello, Rioteers, and welcome to the Vegilution. Ryan here of the Mighty Plant-Based Riot team, and I'm interrupting your program to tell you about an upcoming YouTube channel entitled Plant-Based Riot Recon Edition. This channel will take our listeners even deeper behind enemy lines, where we will expose more disinformation created by our very own American food industry. At the Recon Base Camp, we will provide our listeners with in-depth physiology and pathophysiology lectures, how-to cooking videos provided by yours truly. Dangerous Dan will get his tool belt and show our listeners how to construct the garden of their dreams, while Mighty Mike, the small man with the big plan, will show you his tips and his secrets for creating the most nutrient-dense plants. Rioteers, don't believe the hype. The Vegilution will be televised. Tune in for more information and more details about Plant-Based Riot Recon Edition. Make the choice. I say it again, you've been had, you've been took, you've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, let us stray, run on muck, this is what he does. You've been had, and what makes matters worse is you're allowing it. A lifetime of nutritional deception has forced us into the fight for our lives. We are the plant-based bride. We are here to tear down the curtain of secrecy created by our very own American food industry. A plant-based diet and a disease-free life are not out of reach. Make the choice. Mike, do you use pesticides or herbicides in your gardens? I don't use any herbicides, right? Those would be used to, to kill plants or control weeds. Um, I handpick weeds uh, every week. Um, I have lots of friends and family who help me with that. <laughs> um, I occasionally will use insecticides, uh, only ones that are organically approved, and beyond that, ones that I consider to be non-toxic to people, as well as beneficial predators, you know, non-target um, species that I don't want to harm. So, you know, things like BT, I will use rarely. BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacteria found in soil that produces a toxin that helps to control caterpillars. So um, when you have, you know, 50 uh, cabbage looper moths flying around your garden. The white ones, right? Those little white butterflies laying eggs on your kale, laying eggs on your lettuce. It, it's helpful to apply a little bit of BT, which is basically a biological, not chemical, um, that will help to interrupt that cycle of caterpillars that are eating your greens. Oftentimes only once a year is needed. Okay. All right. So you're not, you, it's, you're not dousing your entire garden with these things, right? No. Great. I like that idea. For the most part, pesticides are only useful for marketing purposes. Mm, which right? I think we're going to get into here today. So yeah. some more of the aesthetics the than aesthetics, anything else. Right. So today's episode, organic or not, in this show we're talking about organic versus conventional produce and the impact on your health and wallet. Hey guys, I'm Dan, husband, father of three, vegan for a couple years now, cameraman, and lover of the arts. I'm Brian, I'm a metabolic scientist, a 23-year executioner of eggplant, and I do research in diabetes. I'm Mike. I'm my quasi-vegan. I'm a plant scientist, and I'm a family man, and a vegetable vendor at a farmer's market. The Atwater Village Farmer's Market, right? That's right. The in town. There it is. We're often at the grocery store in the produce section, and we're bombarded with organic labels or locally grown labels and signs, and you go to the farmer's market and you see grown locally or organic, and there's a lot of bombardment coming that way. Is organically grown produce better for us than non-organic fruits and vegetables? Um, so that area um, of research is 
underfunded and not much attention is given to that. Um, we definitely have a gap in research focusing on the difference between organic and conventionally grown food and how it impacts our health. Um, if we look at the current findings that do exist in that area, we see that statistically there is a um, benefit with eating less pesticides um, and less herbicides and uh, just a few compounds within the plants show that a uh, organically grown plant is a bit healthier by looking at individual compounds in the plant. So not holistically, the plant isn't healthier for you holistically, but just a couple of compounds seem to be uh, elevated in plants grown organically. Interesting. For me, it seems like it's it really depends on the farm, right? So like if you have one organic farm and another organic farm, how can you tell them apart? Big organic versus small organic. Ooh. Uh, small scale versus industrial scale. Um, so to me, if you have if you're talking organic on a large scale, oftentimes organic companies will be owned by conventional companies, and then fields will be rotated every three years so that they qualify for for organic certification. So to me, that's one of the reasons why you will have um, similar levels of pesticide residue. And these are conventional pesticide residues on organic produce as well as conventional produce. That's, it's because they're, the same companies are, are just um, rotating the fields and, and operating under a different company name. However, if you're talking about small organic, um, family-owned, uh, i.e. like the families themselves are doing the work, they right. don't have an army of illegals doing the work for them, um, that's drastically different because in my experience, the smaller the farm is, the more practical it is to nourish that soil, to, to amend that soil with compost and useful um, composts like, uh, you know, farm residues that, that um, may not have made it to the market because it didn't look good enough. Sure. That can go back into the soil. Um, Simple farming practices um, on a smaller scale allow for fewer uses of pesticide. So, for example, it's easier to control pests if you have a more diverse garden that's smaller as opposed to one giant monocrop of one type of thing, right? So if you have an, a field of corn that's all the same, it's difficult to control pests in that scenario because it can be a widespread pest. Okay, so so it is. So, what is the answer? You think uh, is organically grown produce better for you? Like we have to look at nutrition. We have to look at where it comes from, region it comes from, how it's made. There's a whole bunch of this is like a. There's a bunch that goes into this, right? Yeah, it's 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 not a simple question right. to answer. It's it's pretty complex. Um, I would well, say, generally speaking, it's not any better than conventional, which is what you kind of said earlier. Yeah, right? I mean, there are exceptions. You know, when you talk about small, small local type farms, but um, when you're talking about going to the supermarket, right? Exactly. That's it, yeah. Then no. Oh wow! And in in nutritional research, there are exceptions as well. You'll see some studies that say vitamin C was elevated in plants that were grown organically, or flavonoids were elevated in plants that were grown organically. But it's holistically, it's the plant itself is not any healthier. Mm -hmm. So, well, as you know, using myself as a guinea pig here, I would assume that organic automatically equals good, particularly when it comes to fruits and vegetable uh, nutrition. Are there other variables to consider, uh, such as environment impact, uh, taste, and cost when purchasing and making the decision whether you buy organic or, or non-organic or conventional? Yes, for me, um, more important than whether or not it's organic is where it came from. So how many miles did it have to travel oh. to get to you, right? So if, if you have organic blueberries from China, one uh, are the organic standards in China the same as the organic standards in the U.S.? No, they're not. Um, two, how much fossil fuel was required to bring those organic blueberries to you, right? So you could be doing the best farming in the world, but if you're burning 
too many fossil fuels and exacerbating climate change, how is that any better? Mm. Oh, right? That's completely unsustainable. Yeah. So you can be organic and unsustainable, which is, you know, odd to think. It is. And, you know, after a, a plant is removed from the soil, you know, it, it begins to wilt and it becomes, it, it oxidizes. And in that process of decay, it's starting to lose uh, all of its nutrients on, on a large scale. So the longer that plant is in transit, um, the longer it takes to get to the grocery store distribution centers. Uh, once it's at the grocery store, at times it can sit in the cooler for about a week. Um, all of those, all of those um, elements have a major impact on the final product that you get before you and you get to eat. So um, I think the nutrition story is more about how recently the plant was removed from the, sto- from the soil uh, that's going to have the best impact on, on your health. Right, like a farmer who's growing um, strawberries or, or tomatoes even um, isn't going... If, if, the, if the farmer is far away from you, um, they're going to pick it when it's green, right? They're not going to pick it when it's ripe. Because if, they, if a farmer were to pick a tomato that was vine ripened by the sun, then it will turn to paste by the time it gets to the store and they won't make any money. So if they pick it when it's green, it's going to be packageable. It's going to um, allow it to be given ethylene gas so that it turns red so that when it gets to the store it's red but it doesn't have a lot of flavor to it so that's to me that's it's kind of a tragedy because some some farms are doing an excellent job at growing produce but because they're so far away they can't really practically get you good tasting food so the distribution's the problem yeah that's right all right so what is organic mike it's all you. So to me, what what is organic? What is the origin of organic? What does it mean? Help me out here. So organic, uh, when I think of organic, I think of rules um, that are dictated by the uh, Organic Materials Review Institute, also known as OMRI. And there's a list of materials that farmers are allowed to use if they are to be um, organically certified. So these are things... Um, which include fertilizers, pesticides, and soil amendments that you might be adding uh, during any stage of your growing. So, um, generally speaking, organically approved materials are are materials that are considered natural, uh, not synthetically derived. These are materials that are Um, non-toxic. However, this is not always the case. I actually um, I read on organic.org that uh, some of the things they consider for qualifying for an organic certification is it has to be absent of sewage sludge. Did you guys know that? Okay, right. I you would assume, sure right? The fuck, hope so that, that our food is absent of sewage sludge. Um, generally, uh, genetically modified organisms, and then most important, um, most important, ionizing radiation. So um, I asked myself while reading this that what the hell has happened in our production of food along, along the time continuum where these elements had to be taken into consideration for growing our food organically? So, um, Mike, do you happen to know of any circumstances where sewage sludge, sludge was a good fertilizer for making organic foods or so okay so what i know about sewage sludge is that it's also known as beneficial biosolids that that has and a that's better a ring to it that's a marketing yeah. name <laughs> okay right so um you know human waste um com- coming from toilets in households eventually will mix with industrial waste mm. And then it will also mix with pharmaceutical waste. Mm. And then this goes to processing plants where it's um, aerobically or anaerobically digested to remove um, most of the water, Mm -hmm. some of which can be filtered and used again for irrigation, like in gray water systems. So if, if the general population knew that this sort of thing was happening like just everything you just said about the pharmaceutical waste the industrial waste the human waste right if people knew on a mass scale that this was making its way to the plants that we 
potentially consume. Um, I, I think the number one question everyone would be asking is then, why isn't all of our food organic? And why are we eating things that might be potentially cross-contaminated with pharmaceutical waste? That's a good point. Well, I mean, from a practical standpoint, uh, the, the creation of sewage sludge is uh, a colossal uh, effort and finding w- what to do with it yeah. Uh, is a difficulty. So I, I know New York is actually test piloting this right now. Did you know that? That they're taking all of the waste from Manhattan and they're moving it up the Hudson River and that waste is then being taken to Pennsylvania to be used to create crops. And people are really having a problem with it because they, they advertise that you know these, cro- these crops were made or are grown with human waste and people are like, I, I want nothing to do with that. Right. So, um, so go ahead. Well, I mean... From what I know about sewage sludge, is it's not particularly useful for crop production. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you think about nutrients uh, or minerals that plants need to grow, those would be things like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and other micronutrients. Um, so, sewage sludge, for the most part, uh, you know, may may have one at one point had nitrogen and phosphorus. And potassium in it mm-hmm. but most of that gets leached away because it's being mixed with water you know in municipal sewage systems so typically typically those valuable minerals get leached away or washed away mm-hmm. uh, and then discharged into the ocean mm. or into groundwater mm. so what's left behind the sludge material that's dried and then packaged and shipped that doesn't really have a lot of that plants need okay. um, but what it does have is a lot of toxic material right. that's radioactive and like heavy heavy metals are in there as yeah. well so um, it's it's a massive problem that everyone is contributing to on a daily basis right <laughs> and uh, finding what to do with it is something that hasn't really been solved right but what bothers me is that you know organic food with the organic label is being marketed in a way where they want you to pay a premium to have these potential things not be in it. Right. right? And the people that can't afford to buy groceries right. at a premium, they run the risk of possibly eating food that has pharmaceutical waste, industrial waste, or residues of those. So to me, it's it's when I saw that, I was like, wow, that's really interesting. And I, I think people need to be aware of that, of what these qualifications are to get this organic status. It's so, crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. So, crazy. so um, bringing this back a little bit to, uh, I want to talk about um, pesticides, herbicides. I want to know what they are. I, I, I also want to know, are, are all pesticides and herbicides bad? I would say uh, they're not all the same, right? So uh, within the category of pesticide, there are fungicides, which are the most toxic to people, right? Because fungi... Uh, that which grow mushrooms, as you know, um, fungi are actually similar to mammals in mm. their in their evolution. So, if you can create a toxin that will kill a fungi, it's it's going to be toxic to people as well because oh. we 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 share similar genetic pathways. Um, and then, second least toxic would be the insecticides, which kill, you know, as it's as it sounds, insects, all arthropods. Um, and then the third would be herbicides, which kills uh, plants, namely weeds or plants out of place. And so, um, so all of them aren't. There's useful ones, and there's some that are overused. It's bad, right? So there's organically approved pesticides, oh, okay. and then there are conventionally approved pesticides, each with their own category of how toxic they are. Wow. Um, so what do you use in your garden, or what? Dive, I know you talked about it a little bit at the beginning of the episode. Continue that. I think this might be a good spot to hear yeah, more. So I don't use very many pesticides, and I don't have to use them very often. However, I occasionally will get infestations. Of what? Like what's infesting your... So occasionally I'll get an infestation of scales or cottony cushion scales. Those um, are like little... They look like little shells that attach themselves to the stems of your plants. 
and ants uh, oftentimes will pick them up and farm them by attaching them to plants. And so if you get a certain amount of these scales all over your vegetables in like a certain vegetable box, they can, uh, you know, in about a month completely kill the plant by sucking the sugar water out of its stem until it can no longer um, produce any more sugar because it can't transport water to the top portion of the plant. So, you know, in order to control these scales and as well as the ants that are uh, constantly moving in, I'll use something like uh, diatomaceous earth, which is a fossilized algae, and it mechanically scratches the ants and the scales because uh, under a microscope it's almost like glass, like broken glass. So when they climb onto the diatomaceous earth, it looks like a white powder when you apply it. Right, and that's what they, it gets in their joints and everything. Is that the part they, that it yeah, attacks if they, them like that? If they rub against it, it scratches their exoskeleton, and then they lose water because they're scratched open, and they die because of dehydration. So it's a mechanical way to control pests. So is that? Do you think that manner of controlling pests? Is that something we could do on a larger scale? Is that something that these large farms can do? I would say generally no, because, well, as far as I know, um, it's not economical on a large scale. Okay. I don't know what the availability of diatomaceous earth is. I know it's dredged up from lake bottoms. Yep. And so, you know, the quantity that that might be needed and the labor required to apply on large scale farming... Um, you know, just may not make it feasible. So, so I think you hit on something really important, and I want to talk about it. You said it's not economically feasible, right? So, right. Instead, we're using these chemicals, and I think it's really important that people understand how these chemicals work and what they do to the pests that eat the plants. So, most of these pesticides are neurotoxins, right, or some type of toxin that disrupts the physiology of the insect or the pest. Um, they, they have certain pesticides that, uh, destroy the nervous system. They have certain pesticides that destroy endocrine signaling in these, these insects, or they destroy the digestive tract and the tissue inside of the stomach of the insect so that, um, these animals or not these animals, these pests, uh, essentially, uh, perish over time. It's not something that happens quickly, right? But it's not economically feasible to find alternatives but the current manner in which we're growing these plants, um, we're also consuming these pesticides, which are, we take in these pesticides and, and these agents that are destroying neurons, destroying the digestive tract, destroying endocrine signaling. Um, they can have that type of effect on us. And what's really interesting is when we're eating a salad, Right, we go somewhere. We we eat a, a big salad with lots of varieties of vegetables in it. We can almost certainly assume that all of those plants did not come from the same source. Right, the same farm did not provide all of those plants. So now we have to consider that we're eating a cocktail of pesticides that are coming from different places and different farms, and we're eating these plants over the course of our lifespan which now we have pesticide accumulation over the pest of our, over the course of our lifetime. So it really kind of frustrates me that we have these alternatives but we don't use them because they're not right. financially and you know smart investments. However, um, if we want to buy the alternative, it comes with the higher price tag. That's right. Right? So it's a bit frustrating. That is frustrating. Yes. So to me, the answer is we need more farmers. We need more small farmers yeah. to take up the baton right? and to use these alternative methods. Because if you don't do it, then you can't complain. You exactly. get what you get because you're not taking action. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> grow, grow a garden in your community. Have, you, have other people in your community start the garden. You can, you can have your own little ecosystem. We're getting going, that right? bumper sticker made. Grow a goddamn garden. It's awesome. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.
So have you guys heard of uh, the Dirty 12, the Clean 15? These, these are right. fruits and you guys for these are fruits and vegetables that when we go to the grocery store, we're like, do I buy organic? Do I not? Maybe this that doesn't have a rind or, or it does have a rind and maybe it's less susceptible. I, I'm, I'm trying to, I want to figure out really like, so I get that strawberry, spinach, nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, pears. I'm reading the, the Dirty 12 here. Tom, uh, tomatoes, celery, potatoes, uh, sweet bell peppers are like uh, they're, they're more fragile and they require more pesticides to fight off bugs compared to harder produce such as asparagus and broccoli. But, and here's, here's what I'm getting at, is are there certain types of fruits and vegetables that it doesn't make a difference if it's organic or not? That, that um, like does that mean that uh, pesticides and herbicides uh, are not sticking with that vegetable or, or, it's, or fruit, it's not getting in the inside? Like break that down for me. So, is that a concern, or does does do these um, agents get inside uh, of the vegetables? So, from what you just read, it sounds like um, the plants that have more cellulose or a harder rind or skin, a, a thicker skin, appear to be safer. Does that does that sound accurate? That would be the clean yes. fifteen, like avocado, sweet corn, pineapples, cabbages, uh, so onions. Think about think about it's thicker. If right. You touch these plants. Think about how tough they are in your hands right, right, they're right really they're not delicate plants like arugula or like spinach right um and they're not eating raw necessarily right you're eating the inside not the outside yeah is that that's yeah, that, yeah. but but is it mike you were kind of saying earlier when we were talking about this episode could you said you wouldn't be surprised if some of these agents got inside of these thicker oh, yeah. walled i mean like for example uh i grow bananas and um if i were to like spray some kind of fungicide. Wait, wait, wait. You grow bananas in Sierra Madre? Yes, I do. <laughs> We're in the subtropics, my friend. <laughs> they, will, they will grow here. It's actually one of the easiest things to, really? to grow here. Yeah. That's bananas. Wow. Wow. So, you know, like I imagine, like when my when my banana bunch starts forming, there's actually one just a few feet away from here. Okay. Um, when the banana flower opens and uh, a, a palm or a, like a, a bunch of bananas start to form, they're green and they almost look like a leaf. I mean, a flower is a, a modified leaf, to be to be precise. So, like, when when a plant or when a fruit is forming on the plant, and it goes through its different stages, if there's any materials applied to that fruit, I mean, it's going to go in. Whether it's the soil or sprayed on topically, yeah. Or, yeah okay. I mean, materials can become systemic uh, within the plant just by being sprayed onto the plant interesting you know okay. like the stomata of a leaf is opening and closing so materials are entering and leaving so um as far as i understand it um fruits generally have fewer materials in them uh than the leaves do but that's more in terms of so like soil accumulation right so if i'm growing a plant um the leaf if there's like if there's like a, a lead, toxic um, heavy metal lead that's in high levels in the soil, the leaf is going to accumulate that lead, and then the fruit might have a fraction of that. So less than the leaf would, but less than the leaf, it could. Right. You'd be surprised if it wasn't in there. That's right. Wow. So what about accumulation of pesticides on the soil? Like if you have a a particular plot of land that's constantly receiving pesticide treatment. Over the course of several years, you would imagine that that soil is retaining a lot of pesticides, pesticide uh, residue. residue, right? So could could that be taken up into the soil and into the roots and then actually be a part of that tree or a part I, of that plant? There, there are pesticides that can that can become systemic within a plant, yes. Okay. okay. I'm not 100% sure if they can be taken in through the root material, mm -hmm. but I know that they can be injected in. Just like viruses can be injected into a plant through pests oh. sucking on the juice. So that would fortify the plant more if it was injected in the plant rather than just being sprayed on the outside. Yeah, that's right. That is, it's almost like the flu shot for plants. You give yeah. it a little little dose of the flu so you create you know antigens and immunity to that flu and right. then you're able to defend it better. Right. Interesting. Learning something new every day here. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, I want to talk about um, an organically approved fungicide known as copper sulfate. So copper-based fungicides 
uh, are used a lot in grape growing. So I used to grow grapes um, in my backyard for about three years. And um, I loved the grapes. They were beautiful. And um, is that a was it a white grape or it was red flame seedless grapes? I had Thompson and I had um, oh my gosh, what's the other variety? It's um, mm -hmm. it's escaping me at the moment. Concord, there it is. So I had these different grape varieties. Um, they were very productive. Um, it was actually overwhelming how many grapes I was getting. You know, it was something like you know, close to a thousand pounds really? of grapes. Yeah. What? A year. A year, yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, the production was so immense, which I wasn't expecting. However, um, in about a year or two after my grape production started to really climb, I started to notice uh, this powdery mildew. And you knew what it grapes. was. I knew what it was. I mm. learned about it in school. Mm. And, you know, the first year I saw it, uh, I was... Where did you go to school? I went to school at Cal Poly Pomona and studied plant science. Shout out. Ooh, all right. Yes, a lot of good professors there, which I kind of disagreed with a lot in the beginning. But now having been a farmer for, for so many years, I, I can kind of understand what, what they were saying now. We may have to do a <laughs> podcast over there at some point. Do you want to give a shout out to any particular professor? You know, the one professor that um, I think had the most impact on me was Victor Wagerson. And uh, he he just had um, such a real um, and in your face uh, account awesome. of what farming really was. Wow! So, so <laughs> we have Victor to thank for the tenderest in town. <laughs> I guess awesome. so. Thanks, Victor. <laughs> so um, going back to the grapes, I I noticed this powdery mildew just kept creeping up on me, and each year it got worse. I tried lots of different alt like organic alternative methods to control it. I tried using milk because I read that milk would control the powdery mildew. It did not. I tried using um, baking soda. I used vinegar. I used oils. Um, so many things. I So at after having used so many things that, that didn't work, I decided why don't I try this organically approved fungicide with copper in it. It's called uh, well, it's a, I won't name the, the product name, but it's called um, copper fungicide, copper sulfate, right? It's blue. It's a blue liquid. And I use that's that. That's the stuff you see on the vineyards in France? Is that the, that's the stuff? That's, that's right, the, yeah. Well, you know, there is something known as Bordeaux mixture. That's what that is, huh? That's kind of the old version I of see. it. okay. So Bordeaux, France invented this mixture, which was a, mix, a mixture of lime, which is calcium hydroxide, and sulfur, which is a strong antifungal, plus copper. So it was this blue. That'll keep people away a little bit, right? That's right. So it would be it would kind of be boiled into this soupy mix, and it was originally applied on the perimeter of grapes in Bordeaux, France, to keep people from picking the grapes as they were walking by, <sighs> and so it worked because people saw this weird bluish residue on the leaves and the grapes and they were like ew that's kind of gross I don't want these grapes and it gave them kind of a weird taste so um, but it turned out that this this mixture actually uh, made those grapes healthier and more productive than the ones that weren't sprayed so the powdery mildew fungus was something that was always there affecting these grapes and um, this copper fungicide worked so it stuck so it's been used since the late 19th century to control this fungus. Um, and so what I started to realize was that domesticated grapes, as we are familiar with... They don't bite. <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop they've been They've been bred in a certain direction to be very productive and to yield a lot of grapes. Whereas the wilder grapes, they don't yield quite as much, but they seem to have amazing resistance to disease. So what I... What I see is that the domestic grape uh, has become kind of an appendage of human thought, right? It's, it's part of us now, and in order for it to continue to perform, we have to basically spray it with this copper fungicide. Then organic production comes onto the scene, 
And, you know, copper fungicide is an approved material for organic production. And it turns out that it's one of the most toxic materials you can use as a pesticide. I would say it's more toxic than most conventional pesticides currently. Wow. You know, copper um, in very small amounts is a useful mineral for plant growth. But if you have a lot of it, it's toxic to pretty much everything. I was just going to say that. To ma- ask you that. Which includes mammals, us, uh, birds, fish, aquatic organisms, earthworms. And so, you know, it, it will destroy soil health. It will poison the person who's applying it. So I, you know, I tried it. Um, and what happened? You said... You- I didn't notice any ill effects in my own health, but I, I mean, I only used it a couple times... But you used to have hair, though, didn't you? <laughs> I still have, <laughs> still have a full head of hair. <laughs> oh, I see it, I see it again. You've been had. You know, you know, I after having used it and then look, doing some research about it, I, I made the decision to just stop using it because I, I felt that it was just too toxic to be worth it. And what happened to your grapes? I ended up pulling them out. Oh. And I replaced them with passion vine. Because the passion vine um, is very, di- very disease resistant, very productive, and uh, it's good for the subtropics. So, in my view, I felt like maybe grapes just don't work here, um, and uh, so I just switched crops. Rather than try to uh, make something work that was already weak, start with something strong on its own. So I don't need to apply anything to these passion vines. They are strong by themselves and productive. When, and they're coming up, actually. Uh, w- That's right. August, October, September? Throughout, you- throughout the late summer, the passion purple, fruits right? will turn purple and they'll fall I and they're ripe. And they're so abundant. And people love them at the market. I love them. I'll have to come pick some up for me. I just wanted, yeah. I wanted to add to that really quick. I know that um, another pesticide that's used quite a bit is uh, iron phosphate. Iron phosphate, yes. Okay, iron again, just like copper, is a heavy metal. Okay, uh, heavy metals in the human body, transient metals, are uh, highly reactive to free radicals and uh, reactive oxidative species. So if these um, if these particular pesticides are approved, you said, right, it's approved as organic. Right. Okay. Um, these high levels of, of heavy, heavy metals, uh, if consumed, can be problematic in the body as well. So that's true. Yeah, um, so I think that that's really why they. That's why when you buy grapes, they say wash, rinse them well. Right. right. Um, but oh yeah. I think the most damage being done with uh, with copper fungicides are the person is the person applying it. Yeah. You know, um, obviously you should be wearing protective equipment, but. Uh, in some places, there is no protective equipment. On yeah. some farms, especially some in, parts of the world, they internationally, don't, yeah. you'll find people coming out of the jungle, out of a banana jungle, covered head to toe in blue copper. Yeah, wow. And yeah, so t- for me, what was so um, telling about organically approved copper fungicide for grapes is that not only is the copper fungicide not organic by nature it's not naturally derived um but and it's and it's certainly very toxic that seems to contradict my view of what was organic mm, what, what i realized was that if these copper fungicides were not approved for organic use i interpret that as the organic grape business going out of business sure in the future there might not be grapes exactly if they right. didn't if they couldn't use this material they would very likely go under. And that is a considered a priority over our health. To yes, exactly whoever's right. governing these these processes, it's that's more important it's that more we important. have grapes than what these pesticides can do to our bodies, specifically these heavy metal based pesticides. Uh, to your point, Mike, about buying grapes, uh, Brian, I know you came from a cooking background and, and yep. spent some time uh, behind back of house, so to speak. Uh, does organic cost more is my question. It, it's, I, I hear people, that's always the debate. Oh, that costs too much. Or, but looking at not just eating the food, but the ramifications. If I don't buy organic or if I don't buy educated and aware, are my, is it going to cost? What's a stint cost? What's a, what's a visit cost? Yeah, to yeah. What, What's a bypass cost, right? I mean, 
So uh, the organic food has a heavier price tag and they're selling you the idea that uh, organic food is better for you, which we don't have the research to say that definitively, and organic food tastes better. Um, you know, most chefs, modern chefs, uh, if you if you work at a you know fairly uh, high class restaurant, they're not getting their food from Costco, right? The chefs there are going to farmers markets where uh, they are buying into the idea that these plants were grown organically and recently picked. And as we talked about earlier, um, picking the plant from the you know cutting the plant, harvesting the plant, and consuming it as soon as possible is going to have the best health benefits and the best taste, right? Um, but the organic label uh, that we see in the grocery stores uh, and the organic advertisement, it's just really, really clever marketing, all right? Uh, where it came from, um, Mike, you said you knew a little bit about where that that title came from. It kind of came from nowhere. It was obscure until like the mid nineties. And then we started seeing this organic label kind of popping on, um, foods, right. And now you go to the grocery store and everybody has thrown the organic label on everything. All right. So bread is organic. Oats are organic. Granola bars are organic. Um, soda pop. I had to say soda pop because in this part of the region, you guys say soda, right? Mm-hmm. And where I'm from, we say pop. So that's I just, right. all right, now that's organic, right? So you can get an organic Twinkie. Yes. So it's kind of, it's, I think the industry has shown us that this is a marketing tool and there are several tiers or of organicism, right? That is affordable for everybody. So at your socioeconomic level, economical level, you can afford some degree of organic food. Right. So, you know, um, I know if something is considered organic by the USDA, then that is supposed to be 100 percent organic and free of, you know, pesticides, which isn't true. Right, Mike? They can have a certain percentage that has pesticides in it, like 5 percent. Like now it's like 95 percent to qualify, right? To qualify for that organic label. Is that is that accurate? Honestly, I do not know for sure. Okay. So, obviously, the organic label is going to cost the most for the consumer, right? So, you're going to pay a a heavy fine for that. Um, They also have that, um, you know... I mean, like, in my view, if if you have an organic label and it says, grown without pesticide, Mm -hmm. um, take a look at that produce. Yeah. Does it look completely undamaged? Yeah. If it's if it looks completely undamaged, there were there were pesticides used. Right. And how much does it cost you? If it's really expensive, there's a good chance that the farmer was using pesticides to protect that crop, right? Farmers don't want to spend a lot of money, you know, spraying pesticides. They're expensive, yeah. and the organically approved ones are even more expensive. So they they want to use those as little as possible. But if they if they're going to get a a significant return on investment, they will use them. So you're saying if, if you go to the market and you see whether it's a, the produce uh, at the market, uh, farmer's market, or at the grocery store, if you see damaged, uh, bitten produce... Where do you find that these days? Uh, right, it's, yeah. it's almost nowhere. Yeah, because it's got to look perfect. at my farmer's market. <laughs> and, that, and this is good. Is this good? Are these vegetables healthier and better for you if they have the bite marks on them? I would say yes. Uh, because, because you're not using... I'm not using pesticide for one thing, but when a you know plants create their own pesticides, they create their own defense mechanisms to to prevent them from getting eaten. So you know when a when a plant uh, gets chewed on, it starts to release these um, antioxidants, um, also known to, as polyphenols, to fight, to fight off. That's right. They can re- they can release. Um, Sorry, what was it called? Polyphenols. Um, you know, there's also spicy sugars that are in lots of cruciferous vegetables. And whenever you, if you ever bite into a mustard leaf, you, you start, as soon as you start chewing it. Wait, we're growing this right now, right? Hydroponically, the mustard. That's right. We're growing mustard. Japanese mustard, baby greens. That's right. So you're saying bite into it and you're going to taste what? You taste all this heat, right? It's, it's very spicy. 
Bring so the that's heat. A, yeah, that's a sulfur-containing sugar. Right? Okay. Kind of like an onion has a lot of sulfur as well. When you cut it open, it's you're releasing sulfuric acid into the air, which burns your eyes. That's actually a a powerful defense mechanism. So if a if a caterpillar starts eating mustard, it kind of it's it will start burning the mouth of the of the caterpillar. Okay, so let me get this straight. Because I was reading this. So when a when a plant is taking up nutrients, okay, when it's growing, it can either mobilize those nutrients to help it grow, or it could mobilize those nutrients to defend itself. Is that is that accurate? Yes. Okay. So that's what I was reading in the new uh, the research papers. And I thought was what was really ironic is is what you had said about these defenses create higher levels of polyphenols. That's right. And, and sulfuric acid. And um, potentially higher levels of vitamin E and vitamin D. And if we let the plants defend themselves in absence of pesticides, all of those agents, all those chemical agents that it upregulates is very healthy to our body and protecting us from disease and protecting us from cancer. And interestingly, the heavy metals that we would take in from these certified pesticides would then be defended by the agents you just told us about from a plant that is defending itself. Right. So, so um, a plant won't produce as much of its own defenses if it doesn't need to. Because the pesticide is doing it for the plant. That's right. It's right. compensating uh, for the plant. And so, you know, that, that residue you don't want right. to be eating. So let them defend themselves because their right. defense is only benefiting us yeah, and exactly. our health. Um, so we digressed from the or the organic labeling. That, that's great, though. So there's that was an awesome digression. Um, so now there's another tier of the organic labeling said made with organic um, material, and what that means is that seventy percent of that food stuff is made with organic growing methods, and then thirty percent of it is not. Okay, so now. We've made the organic label a bit more affordable because with that comes it's a, a small, medium, and large. Now that's right? right, and then you know, and it and it goes down the list. You know, there's there's other labels that, you know, they use less than seventy percent organic, and then there's other labels that use less than fifty percent. So what you have to pay attention to, dear listener, is the words that are surrounding the organic label. So look at the fine print. You know, they're going to, these uh, these people that are marketing um, and making the packages, they're going to blow up the word organic so that you make an impulse buy and say, oh, it's organic. And they're going to charge you more at the register for that. So make sure you're looking at the adjectives and the adverbs that kind of come before the word organic and make sure that it's, you know, if it is USDA certified organic, then you you can buy that food stuff with confidence that 95% of it was made and grown with organic methods. Mike, you had said earlier that um, buying local could be better than buying organic. Absolutely. What is local and what tastes better? So to me, local... If that's the case. You know, local just means that it's close to you, obviously. And in my view, local means under you know, under 75 miles and which that's, which is still a long way. Yeah. But still that's pretty short in comparison to what other right. Farmers market uh, vendors are coming pretty far and wide these days. Right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, for California, most farmers are coming from the central Valley going into LA County to sell, which is quite a drive. Um, so to me, that's not quite local. Uh, unfortunately, what four, 400 miles. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, not to try and discredit any sure. farmers in the Central Valley. They, they're they hardworking and there's some excellent farms out there. But they have come a long way to go to where money is, it, exactly, essentially. Yeah. So, right, it costs too much to have land in Southern California to to uh, do a, a profitable garden, right? Like, it's right. Just, yeah, you get ag. Might not be feasible. You get ag water if you go to to the Central Valley. If you go to Ella County, all of a sudden you're paying for city water. Mm, good point. So e- even if it's coming 300, 200 miles, if these farmers are picking the vegetables the night before, then it doesn't matter. Isn't that right? So if they're if they're harvesting the night before or two nights before the farmers market, then does the distance travel really matter? 
I guess you, I guess it doesn't. Uh, however, you're talking my, like carbon footprint and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, that goes into that. Definitely, carbon footprint is is a huge issue. Or freshness, wilting. Yeah, I mean, in my in my experience, being able to pick the day before a market. Uh, it's not really feasible for some of the larger farms. But Mike you, when it. do you? Yeah, what, you <laughs> pick. You're up all night. You're up all day. I know we're harvesting the night before. You want it cut at the very last second. Quick, quick yeah, exactly. sh- shameless plug here. <laughs> you know, like I would say, you know, if you're a large farm and you're, you may, you may cut as much produce as you could sell for the week, right? So you'll go to one market and you'll try to sell as much as you can. Then you'll box it up, and then you'll go to a refrigerator somewhere to store it for the night or if you have a refrigerated truck you'll put it back in the truck and then you'll bring it out again second day for the next market so by the end of the week your produce is starting to look pretty wilted so that's why when we go to the farmer's market your your stand was performs that's why all your vegetables look super fresh compared to right it's it's night and day difference everything's flat and like but you're also out there spraying and and tossing it misting it with water yeah. cooling it down it's hard to do the, in keeping the it in hot shade. summer but that's it's not easy your stuff looks good so based upon everything we've been talking about that method is going to provide the consumers with the most nutritious plant possible i believe so right so picking it fresh and young yep and right. locally letting it defend itself so it's creating those antioxidants those flavonoids those vitamin e vitamin d all those antioxidants anti-carcinogenics no herbicides pesticides occasionally i will use them but it's rare it's usually not needed so in my view if you have a plant that is getting enough sunlight not too much getting enough water not too much and getting um, enough of the minerals it needs and not too much you're going to have a healthy plant that can defend itself and will likely survive pest damage and disease. That's pretty amazing. For those of you following along at home, uh, ne- coming up next, we're going to be doing a podcast about growing a garden where we're dissecting the various garden techniques and diving deeper into Farmer Mike's brain. Um, this has been a fantastic organic episode. Do you guys have any last minute wrapping thoughts on this so we could probably talk about this for another hour and a half um there were a lot of gaps in what we had discussed but you know we're just trying to stay committed to a time frame um i i as i do in every episode i urge the listeners to begin to read themselves and to begin to do research on their own so they can see the ways they are being manipulated to spend more of their money um you know in conclusion we don't know whether or not the organic, organic and conventional, or not. We, we don't know if it has any uh, benefits to health. We see that uh, both forms, both methods of growing contain pesticide. Uh, we know that, um, you know, the pesticides, you know, we, we can uh, obtain pesticides in our body, not just through eating, but through our eyes, through our nose, through our mouths. We can breathe it in. Um, and we know that we store pesticides in bodies and our body. Uh, women, they have a you know you can see in women who are lactating how much pesticides they store in their body. Um, and all of these things we can measure. So you can do it through a urine test. You can do it through a blood test. If this is something you're concerned about, um, I urge you to go get it get it measured. Okay, see how much poison. We you've been taken in through your diet and through your daily. Activities. What that's a lipid panel or what is that? How do you it's get just that tested? A, it's a, a common just a, a blood chemistry test that okay. they can test. Um, they can, and again you can just pee in a cup. They can measure it in, in your urine as well. Wow. Um, and you know as always, edu- educate your children. Let them don't let them grow up in the same environment that we had grown up, where all of these things are are concealed behind closed doors. So give them the information to give them the power. Uh, so that they can make decisions for themselves and live a, a healthier life. On that note, we are the PBR. PBR. Plant-Based Riot. You're making the choice to live longer. What are you going to do with the extra disease-free years? Uh, all the links will be uh, posted in the show notes that we talked about. Thanks, plant eaters. Tune in next week for more Garden Gab, and I'm going to own that one this time. Eat well. Now put down the podcast and grow a damn garden. Oh,